evening, everybody. My name is Ingrid Flory, and I'll be moderating tonight. Um, I'm a volunteer with the League of Women Voters of the Northampton area, and I thank you for coming out. For those of you who are not familiar with our organization, the League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization that encourages informed and active participation in government. We work to increase understanding of major public policy issues and influence public policy through education and advocacy. Uh, we're sponsoring tonight's forum on the Community Preservation Act because a question will be appearing on no no the November 8th ballot to repeal Northampton CPA. In addition, the CPA is an issue that our league has studied and endorsed because it supports our goal of meeting basic human needs through the creation of affordable housing. Tonight, panelists in favor will present an overview of the legislation and projects that it has funded in Northampton. We'll then hear from panelists who have concerns about the CPA, and then the audience will have the opportunity to ask questions. So um, if you would like to pose a question, we ask that you write it on a, um, on a note card that's being passed around. Um, that will keep questions organized and succinct so that we get through as many as possible, because we know you have lots of questions. Um, and know that uh, a panelist from each side of the issue will be responding to each question, so please phrase it accordingly. Um, after the audience questions, we will have a very brief break, and then uh, each of the four candidates for the Community Preservation Committee will be coming and um, speaking about themselves <coughs> and answering questions that have been prepared by the League. So, um, so again, welcome. If you would, um, I'd like to introduce our, our panelists. Um, Don Biachi, if you want to take a moment to speak about yourself and tell us why you're here. Hello, uh, my name is Don. This is Don. Yeah, you don't need to touch the mics. My name is Don Biachi. I live in Laurel Park, and um, I was on the Community Preservation Committee for four years, just until this last January. So glad to be here. My name is Downey Meyer, and I'm on the Conservation Commission and I'm the Conservation Commission representative to the CPC, and I'm also on the school committee for Ward 7, which means I'll get the privilege of being here again tonight, or tomorrow night, uh, from 7 o'clock until 10.30 or so. so. <laughs> My name is Jonathan Wright, and I've uh, run a construction business here in Northampton for the last 38 years. Hi, my name is Mike Kirby. I uh, write, uh, I have a blog, and I am on the uh, Paradise City Forum, which is holding a forum. This place is actually holding a debate on the question next week. And um, that's it. Hi, my name is Jesus Lerma, and I'm a listener of our MS, and I came here to speak um, to other issues regarding the CPA. So we'll begin um, by getting a little, little education on what the CPA is and how it has functioned in Northampton in six years that's been in existence. Um, Don, are you going to start speaking to that? Um, so uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what the CPA is, what it does, what it's accomplished in Northampton. Uh, then Downey is going to talk about the process that, that the committee and the city go through in reviewing proposals and, and making decisions. Uh, and then Jonathan and Downey and I are going to give a few examples and then there'll be a few, a few closing remarks. Uh, so um, the, the Community Preservation Act was enacted, it's a state law in the year 2000, allows cities and towns to adopt a property tax surcharge of up to 3% to fund four activities. Acquisition and preservation of open space first. Second, creation, preservation, and support of community housing. Third, preservation and restoration of historic buildings and artifacts. And fourth, investments related to recreation. State, the state of Massachusetts pays matching funds uh, based on surcharges from the registry of deeds and land court fees that are deposited into a statewide community preservation trust fund. A minimum of 10% of the annual revenues must be used for each of the first three allowed uses, and that's open space preservation, community housing, and historic preservation. Uh, Northampton, uh, uh, Northampton adopted the CPA in November of 2005 at the 3% property tax level and included all the exemptions that are permitted under the Act. 
So the first 100,000 of residential property value is exempted from the tax. Low income households are exempted. Uh, that's uh, households with incomes up to 80% of area median. Just to give you a sense of what that means for a two person household, that's up to $44,000 right, in Northampton. And low and moderate income seniors with incomes up to 100% of area median income, which would be 55,000 for a two person family, are also exempted. Um, so uh, we were attempted opted to take the maximum exact exemptions. Um, in fiscal year 2011, the average amount of the CPA surcharge for a Northampton property owner was $79, or less than $7 a month. Uh, while the state match has declined, it originally was at about 100%, or at 100%. Um, over the five years, it's averaged about 50%. And to date, we have approved 51 projects in Northampton, 16 historic preservation projects, 15 open space projects, 13 community housing projects, and four recreation projects, and three projects that benefit multiple areas. A total of approximately 6.7 million has been awarded to these projects. And the breakdown is roughly, for historic preservation, 2.4 million, for open space preservation, just under 2 million, for community housing, 1.4 million, and for recreation, 950,000. Other financing sources have matched the CPA funding for these projects, with more than 17.5 million in other dollars. Statewide, almost 150 communities have adopted the CPA. Community preservation advocates recognize that the law could be improved, and a bill currently before the Massachusetts legislature would make three improvements. First, it would increase the statewide match for CPA funds to a minimum of 75%. Uh, as I noted before, it's declined uh, since, since its uh, origin. Second, to try to make the CPA more appealing to larger cities, which have shown some reluctance to pass CPA, the bill would allow other local resources to count toward the state match and would add a commercial exemption for the first $100,000 in property value to mirror the residential exemption that currently exists. And third, the bill would permit cities and towns to rehabilitate existing outdoor parks and other recreational facilities with CPA funds. These are all good changes supported by community preservation advocates in Northampton and across the state. But their enactment is not necessary for us to continue to have an effective CPA program in Northampton, which has been a leader among cities and towns in using the funds to support a broad range of important community projects. Yeah. So, I want you to imagine, or not imagine, because I'm sure this describes many of you, or all of you, you have something that you want to do for your community, for Northampton, and you need $5,000. And you've applied to a number of charitable organizations, but you can't get that money. Or maybe you have even bigger dreams and you need $100,000. But again, you've gone through grant rounds and you haven't gotten that money. You could at that point turn if you were within one of the eligible program areas, if you were going to preserve or create community housing, if you were going to preserve, acquire, or create open space or recreational facilities, if you were going to preserve historic assets in this community, you could come to the Community Preservation Committee. And the first thing that you have to do is you have to fill out an eligibility form. The eligibility form is the check because we operate under the state law. We cannot go outside of it. One thing that we currently can't do is we can't help you with maintenance. So if you're just trying to put on a coat of paint because it's New England and it's four years later, we can't help you with that. Um, we also can't help you if you're trying to do something that the city government should be doing. There's a wall between what can be funded under CPA and what can be done with general government funds. It's in fact the Department of Revenue has an opinion saying that there can not be supplanting of general government revenue. So it really has to be something extra for the community. Once you fill out your eligibility form, it's going to be reviewed by staff. And if it's even close to the line, it will be reviewed by the full committee. And we are here to serve the community. So staff will work with you if your project is not eligible. They will basically tell you, I'm sorry, but you have to seek funding elsewhere. If a portion of your project was eligible, eligible I'm sorry, they might encourage you to apply for funding for that portion only. After your eligibility is approved, you then have to put together an application. And this should be extensive documentation of not only what you're going to do, 
how much it's going to cost, where you're going to get funding aside from CPC or CPA, but also what is going to be the benefit to the community. And this is one of the most important things that you have to do because it is one of the most important factors that we consider above all. Um, does it have a breadth of benefit? Does it have a benefit that's going to be lasting? And those are very important factors. And again, staff is going to make sure that you, if you are not a professional grant writer, that you bring forward your best material, that you bring us what you have to offer for the city. Because we're not trying to stop you from succeeding if there really is benefit there. So you put together your application, and it's, it's wonderful. And it gets sent to all of us on the committee, all nine of us, who are coming from different constituencies, from the Historical Commission, from the Conservation Commission, from the Recreation Commission, from the Planning Board, an appointment by the Mayor, an appointment by the City Council, two members who are elected at large, um, and I'm forgetting one more, I'm sorry, and also from the Housing Authority. So a broad spectrum of people who represent interests in the community, some of them elected, some of them appointed, and we are going to consider your applications, and we're going to go into them in depth, because we have a very serious responsibility in awarding these funds. Um, none of us go into any funding round saying we have to award any money at all. If there are quality applications, then we are happy to do the work that the CPA allows us to do. But we're not going to award money just because they're applications. Once we consider your applications, we're going to send you written questions. And the written questions and the applications are all going to be posted on the CPC website. So as far as transparency, if you're curious about what do we do at CPC, and there are some unfamiliar faces here, so some of you haven't come down to visit me on Wednesday nights. Um, but if you can't make it because you've worked your day job and you're tired, um, you can go to the website and you can see the questions that are being asked. And if you don't think the questions are pointed enough, if you don't think the questions cover the ground that needs to be covered, I think every member on the committee would welcome your input, either by email, either by phone call, or show up at the public comment that we have at the beginning of every meeting. The questions come, to, uh, come from us, the answers have to come back and they're in writing, again the answers are posted. The next thing that will happen is either a site visit, if the site visit is going to give us information that will be valuable in deciding whether or not to fund a project, and then the applicants will come in and they will present to us their applications. And again, this is a time for them to really show us their best. And for us to ask them questions, for us to follow up on the responses to the written questions. Again, they don't come in and present to us until the written questions have been responded to, and we will sometimes follow up on them if we feel the responses are inadequate. Again, because we're taking seriously the fact that the citizens of Northampton are reaching into their pocket to hand us this money to improve their community, and we want to make sure that those dollars are wisely spent. After the presentations are done, there is again a two-week period, and between that presentation and the next meeting, it's really up to the members, or, or sorry, the applicants to you to bring to us the community support if we haven't seen it already. We like it from the beginning, but we tell applicants from the very beginning of the process, it will be critical if we are going to award you money for us to hear, not just from your organization, but from a wide spectrum of the community. The wider the better, the deeper the support, the better. And so projects, if they come with 40 or 50 people to support the project, that's very important to us. If we receive 30, 40, 50 letters, that makes a big difference to us. Because again, this is the Community Preservation Act. And so it's up to you as the community to express your preferences for how that money is spent. And sometimes there are more projects that are worthy than there are dollars to allocate. And then we really need to look to you as a community to say, where would the people of Northampton, where would the voters of Northampton want us to apply that money? So, you've come before us, you've applied, you've rounded up your public support, and we make our consideration, and then we make our recommendations. And they are only that. They are recommendations with conditions that we consider important but they are recommendations to the City Council. 
And sometimes when I hear people say, well, the CPC funded, I, I want to raise my hand and say, no, the CPC recommends. And I see Councilor Barge sitting in one of the front rows. We recommend to the City Council, and the Act is very clear, that the legislative body in the city has the final decision. And again, that is another important check in the process. Our city councilors review the applications. Our city councilors will ask the committee for clarification if they need clarification. The city council is fully empowered to ask the applicant additional questions if they don't feel satisfied. And the city council, just like any ordinance that they vote on, has two meetings which means that any citizens who are interested in participating, if they miss the first meeting, they can show up for the second meeting and have their views considered in public comment. So, the City Council has voted twice. Your recommendation has been approved. You're celebrating, but we're not done with you yet. Now you have to draft a contract. And the contract has to carry the conditions forward from the recommendation and from the City Council resolution because the contract is the document which will allow us to disperse checks to you. And I'll tell you that we have a very able staff member in Sarah LaValle who will not give you checks if you do not comply with your contract. And she has told applicants that before. And she will continue to monitor. If there are conditions before any disbursement goes forward, she will make sure that those conditions are met. If there are conditions during construction or during the project, she will make sure those conditions are met. And finally, it's up to her for post-project monitoring as well. Um, again, because one of the things that's important is these are usually long-lasting investments in the community. And if, if applicants are not carrying through and not giving us the length of, the length of our investment, or the, they're not returning to us something that will last for 50, 100 years, um, then we have to be concerned and we have to look at our process. So your project is done and your work is done, but we still have a very important part to finish, which is we need to reflect after the funding cycle is over on did we do our job. If you don't like the job that the United States Congress does, you can't make them go away. But as you're sitting here tonight, you're considering a decision, do you want us to go away as a CPC? I'm hoping that you'll say no. But we always think as we're going through this that if we're not doing the job that we were elected or appointed to do, that we won't have the ability to come back for the next funding cycle and continue this good work. So we look at our process and we look to see where we can improve. And those improvements and those decisions are put into our CPC plan, which we are required to update regularly. And it's on our website and it's available to you all. And again, when we go through amending the CPC plan, we are always looking for your participation, for your input. And that is pretty much what we do six months to finish around, and then we do it all over again for another six months. I think uh, project is open space. Okay. So, what have you got? The Bean Allard Farm. 185 acres of prime agricultural soils, farmed for centuries. Um, it was an important historical farm during the abolitionist period in Northampton. I have heard it has been was farmed by Native Americans for at least a thousand years before that. Obviously something that is a great asset to the community, um, that if it went under foundations would be lost forever. With the participation of the Ag Commission, the Recreation Commission, the Conservation Commission, the Historic Commission, and many members of this community, a process was put together that resulted in nearly a million dollars, $990,000 of CPA funding being awarded. A lot of that was your money. A good deal of it was state match. 1.5 million or more than the amount invested from Northampton sources came from grant funding from the state. That was matching funding. That was mo money that would not have come into the community without the CPA money being the first dollars in. We attracted the Trust for Public Land, which is an organization that, that does work nationwide. They can really pick and choose where they do their preservation projects. And they were essential 
to do the bridge financing, to basically put down the $2.5 million to take the money from the Bean and Goulet families and allow it to be purchased with the CPA money, the matching money. And I want to say just something about the, those two farming families. I used to drive by those fields and wonder at why they were still there. They were perfectly flat. They were convenient to downtown Florence. I couldn't understand it. Um, but as I went through this process, I learned that these were two families that were attached to their land. They were the farmers that are an important part of our community. And they had held on to that land for as long as they could, keeping it farming. And I'm really happy that the CPA was here to allow them to transfer that legacy forward, not only for farming, but also as it moves forward, forward for Florence Fields, which will be a really amazing recreational asset for our community. Um, just to hit on a couple others quickly, because I know I'm, I'm being prolix here. Um, Turkey Hill. Almost 100, so actually over 100 acres of preserved land. Again, $350,000 of CPA funding. Some of that your tax dollars, a significant part state matched. $632,000 from other funds. And I think this is really important. $140,000 or more than a quarter of that match was from private citizens. Private citizens who not only paid the tax dollars that went to the CPA, not only paid the tax dollars that went to Boston and came back through the state match, but were willing to reach into their pockets yet again. I think that's an amazing testament to how these projects are supported by the community. The Manhattan Rail Trail, $100,000 of CPA funding, $5 million of federal match. I think it speaks for itself. And I took my kids from North Farms Road down for a hamburger at Eastworks, and it was really amazing. I didn't have to worry about cars the whole way. And they rode 18 miles round trip. And I think they were happy that that money was spent. But that's my open space project. <laughs> Thank you. That's great. Um, I want to talk to you about a couple of um, historic preservation projects. One very visible and another not so. The first of the Academy of Music, which is of any public building in Northampton, is probably iconic of the history of this wonderful city, and uh, it's a municipally owned building, but it has a, a private board of directors that, that runs it. And the project that was brought to the CPC was the exterior preservation of this building. Now, buildings in New England, uh, when the paint is dry, they start wearing out again. Um, it's a declining cycle. You all know that if you, if you uh, look at your house, what happens. And this building, uh, these buildings, public buildings need a major refit every 30 to 50 years. It's just what the weather does to us. So the exterior of this building had not had a major refit in uh, almost 70 years. And the project uh, replaced the doors, replaced that historic marquee with an updated uh, marquee. And over the course of two funding cycles, one at $230,000, another at $210,000, also replaced and repaired the windows, the other doors. The building is more energy efficient, uh, it's more secure, it's safer, it uh, has handicap access. And I think a key here is that the new marquee allows the expanded programs of the academy to be uh, very visible from Main Street. Uh, and though it's interesting the planning board did not want them to have the kind of ticker tape thing that, that, that because that would be a distraction to drivers and so on. The, the programs that are offered that you get information about um, is playing a key role in the academy becoming more self-sustaining um, and therefore less of a draw on, on the city's resources. So that's a big plus. It's work that has to be done anyway, and it was done with the CPA funds in a, in a way that uh, really makes it uh, a drawing card for downtown and, and uh, reestablishes the, that building as not something that was once great but remains great. The other project I want to talk to you about is the Northampton Community Music Center, which many of you know is located uh, at the old South Street School. And it remains owned by the city, but the city has made no investment in that property for 35 years. The private institution there is in its 25th year, and uh, about 20 of them, 10, 17 of them, I guess, at this location, they have uh, raised and spent privately $950,000 uh, to renovate that building. The latest project uh, that was brought to them is the 
in, uh, in older buildings, you have waste heat in the basement from, from uh, heating plants, which helps uh, control mold and, uh, and deterioration of the masonry. And the upper floors, when they were renovated and occupied, of course, they've got very high efficiency, high efficiency equipment in there. And as a result, the lower floor was continuing to develop mold, mildew, um, and the masonry needed repair. So the proposal that was made was to uh, not just do those things, but uh, in, in, uh, in concert with that, to develop the space as uh, another 43% uh, increase in square footage. What that means is that um, the, the CPA investment there, uh, which was uh, $150,000, which is about 37% of, of the cost of that project. This is all in addition to the earlier 950. Um, it does allow that there to be an additional recital space there, and uh, a, uh, they will, when they finish raising the rest of the $245,000, they'll have a recording studio there uh, where they can do uh, where youth can, can record uh, rock music and all kinds of other things that uh, are really important for musicians. 800 students uh, participate in programs there. And the Music Center was started in response to the, uh, the start of the long decline in music programs in our public schools. And instrumental lessons were eliminated about 26 years ago, and that was the start of this. So this is really integral to the educational system in Northampton. And the CPA support provided the leverage that has uh, allowed them to do this work, which is uh, uh, not only important, but it, it doesn't have a lot of curb appeal. Uh, it's, not, it's sort of at the other end of the spectrum from the academy but it's essential, allows the building to uh, uh, retain its value and uh, be thermally efficient uh, and, and to provide uh, for these students. No student has ever turned away from, uh, from the Music Center uh, for financial reasons. 17% of the student body uh, is on financial aid, all privately raised funds. So these are both of these, very different ones, have been great investments by the CPC. I know the community is very grateful. So, um, we had about seven minutes left of comments. I don't realize we don't have that, so I'm going to do it. In, we're going to take three of those minutes if you'll indulge us for that. I can give you three minutes. We also have you'll have an opportunity to the audience questions to answer. Um, so I want to I want to talk a little bit about uh, community housing and, and um, just to give a very quick example of three projects that address the need for affordable housing across a continuum of needs. Um, uh, the first is Yvonne's house, which provided, provides uh, group living for homeless men and women in, in a group situation. One apartment for men, one apartment for women. Yvonne Pichero over there is, the, is named after her for all her, uh, all her work in, in helping homeless individuals and families in Northampton. Um, stable housing for people who never had stable housing. Uh, Valley CDC's King Street SRO building. Uh, provides 10 units, five for homeless households and five for very low income households. Again, people <coughs> transitioning from to a more stable housing situation. The most noteworthy thing of that, in my opinion, is that the $225,000 that the city provided was matched more than eightfold by the state. Um, so in terms of a matching ratio, uh, it, was, it just shows um, how they were able to utilize other resources and use only what they needed from the locality. And finally, uh, families uh, transitioning to sustainable home ownership, Habitat for Humanity, five units on Garfield Avenue where families put in a lot of sweat equity uh, and work with their neighbors to create uh, home ownership. Um, two quick things about housing. One is that these are capital investments. It's not a one-time thing. These units provide affordable housing for many years without any additional uh, public dollars. Secondly, uh, the, the matching uh, that I referenced before is, is, for, is particularly for community housing. It's about $3.50 for every dollar that the city invests is matched by other people's dollars. So uh, Downey and, and Jonathan wanted to just say a last word. Oh. I think just two points. One, if the CPA in Northampton goes away, um, some people think that the money will be available for general government. And I just want to emphasize that it won't. Mm -hmm. That that tax goes away, the tax surcharge goes away, and no CPA work goes forward, but no money is available for the schools or for the roads or for the fire department or the police department. The second is that all of the matches that we've talked about will still be out there. 
but they'll be going to other communities. And, and that is not even playing the game, much less playing it well. Um, just a couple of final observations. Um, this democracy that we participate in can be a delicate and mysterious instrument. And um, we are empowered as a community to, to participate in choices about what is best for us as a whole community, not what is best for us individually. And that is a, a, strong, a, a powerful charge. Most of these grants are heavily leveraged. The CPA is locally based, it's locally controlled, it's locally spent. And for many of these projects, it's the only tool in the box. So far from being a, uh, a superfluous uh, item of taxation, I believe that it brings out the very best of democracy in our town. It's the best example we have of democracy working. Thank you. Now to speak a little bit about recent concerns on the CPA and, uh, and speak to why we have this ballot measure to, um, to repeal it in November's election. Um, start with, with Mike Kirby for a few minutes, and then, um, then he's um, I'd like to make something clear, first of all. I'm not really here tonight to argue against the CPA and how it's worked. Uh, we, we became involved because we heard that there was going to be a debate uh, between um, the proponents and the opponents, the, the people that wanted to repeal and the people that would like to see the program go forward. And we were disappointed when it turns out that despite the best efforts of people in the league, uh, the debate did not take place. Um, and so we're here to basically well, one, to plug our own <laughs> program, which is still in the process of formation, which is um, next Thursday, November 3rd, at the Florence Civic Center. And, uh, and the Paradise City Forum is, is uh, holding it. But I also would like to say, Jesus and I kind of share a common philosophical base that in the old days they called goo goos. And a goo goo is a good government person. In other words, a person who is oriented more toward process than results. How is things how are things done? Are they done fairly? Are we are, are do we have a just form of government? Is everybody represented? So that's so that led us to to have this forum next week. <coughs> now let me say that the person who single-handedly inspired me to get on this particular bandwagon, peculiar bandwagon, is uh, the, the anonymous person called Florence Sheik, who you can read in faithfully in the Mass Live. And I think something's happened to the quality of discourse in the community in general because of, for, uh, because of uh, Mass Live, which he said at one point, <coughs> CPA opponents are all cowards. Well, it kind of, there is essentially in this community, we like to pride ourselves for our openness and for our process and our democracy, but there is an an increasing intolerance and a gap between the western part of the city, which has become increasingly poor. In fact, if you look at the New York Times recently, you'll see that the, the trend is that suburbs are becoming poorer. You know? And these are people, let me take one more minute. I think, I think, <coughs> that the people who have, and it wasn't hard to, for those people to get those signatures, um, representing people, a lot of them who are just holding on, who have homes that they maybe can't afford anymore, and they are alienated by some of the big ticket operations. Now, one of those big ticket operations I was personally offended by, and still am, is the Valley CDC 
building on King Street because it's basically, I went down and talked to Joanne Campbell today to have her straighten me out because, you know, that's a good organization. But essentially, by getting involved in a state project like that, the main people that are benefiting are contractors, architects, builders, and it is running about 200,000 a unit for, a, for, a, for a, essentially a tiny space. So essentially, I think in terms of affordable housing where a lot of my energy goes into and enthusiasm toward historic, history, historic preservation, and also affordable housing, we need to go more small projects, more projects with habitat, more projects that don't cost $2 million for one particular project. We need to think about the women or the men that live in, in, the, in houses that are falling down around them. Figure out a way to make this program work for them and make the application project process less forbidding. And also, we need to straighten out the problems within the process itself. Conflict of interest needs to be more aggressively, aggressively dealt with because it's there. And, and anyway, I'll shut up. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. Jesus, what would you like to add? Um, hi everyone. Uh, thank you for coming out here, and I'm grateful to have the opportunity to speak. Um, did my mic just turn on? No, it's not working. Um, I'm actually really nervous, but um, I came out here to speak because I felt it was important. Um, I think it's great that people in this community have dreams to see this community be a more perfect community. Um, that's great, um, but. I don't believe that this community's dreams should be funded by other communities, especially if those communities are poor, and especially if those are poor urban communities. I came out here because I wanted to make sure that everyone was aware that the deed transfer fees that are collected by the state, that are the state fund that provides the matching funds for our communities who adopt the CPA, come from every community. And there are many communities that have not adopted the CPA. And the reason is very clear. It's actually stated in, in a report called the Community Preservation Act, Who Benefits, Who Pays. The reason why there are so many communities that do not adopt it is because of the property tax surcharge. There are poor communities out there that either can't afford to do so or don't have the political muscle to be able to do it. You have communities like Springfield and Holyoke who are not a part of this, Boston, Pittsfield, Worcester, and these are the communities that are largely putting money into the fund. I think we also have to look at the fact that if you go to the CPA website and you look at the map, most of the green, the majority of the communities that have adopted the CPA are in the eastern part of the state. And the western part of the state, except for this little middle part where the Pioneer Valley is, our Happy Valley, is mostly white. Um, the same with central uh, Massachusetts. And when the other communities around us are losing from this, we're losing as well. We might have gotten some of the funding and a little bit of help for our community's dreams, but the rest of the area around us is doing very poorly in those terms. I'd also like to say something about affordable housing and about the affordability of, of living in Northampton. It's become increasingly difficult for low-income people, especially renters, to live in Northampton. As we continually pass overrides and the property tax surcharge from the CPA, these costs are being passed on to the renters, whether because property owners really need to or because they choose to. Community means people, not just places. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
I now have some questions from the audience that I will pose to the, to the panelists. If I could ask that one person you know, from each side can respond to each question, so you can decide amongst you um, who will be the responder for each question. Um, and if and you'll each have uh, two minutes to respond. And I'll give you a 30 second warning. Um, if, if, uh, if there are people who, haven't, who have questions uh, and have not yet submitted them, um, you can pass them down. Yvonne's walking down the aisle, and she will bring them up to me. And if I have time, I will I'll get through as many as I can. So first question, how do you explain to someone who is having difficulty paying their real estate taxes that the CPA is worth it? Who would like to respond? Um, okay. Um, well, I think that um, the way I look at it as a, as a homeowner and that in North Hampton is what am I paying and what am I getting? And when I look at $79 a year that I'm paying, and I'm getting a share of the Academy of Music and Florida Library and some great community housing and Mineral Hills and other open space preservation and Florence Fields and the Bean Allard Farm, I think it's, it's a fantastic deal. And I would just also say that uh, it's true that some of these projects may have gone forward without CPA funds, but some of them certainly wouldn't have gone forward without CPA funds. And I can't think of what projects I would be willing to give up in our community to get my $79 a year back. Uh, so I think that certainly recognize that paying and increase more taxes uh, can be a burden uh, on, on, on people. Um, and I think that well, I believe that it's a modest amount and that the return we get for our investment uh, is well worth it. Okay. Mike or Jesus, how would you respond to someone who is debating whether it's worth it or not? Um, I guess that it's sort of hard. I can't say that things like restoration of the Forbes Library or the Bean Allard Farm are things that we shouldn't have in our community. I think that those are worthy projects. Um, but I think what we also have to realize is that it shouldn't just be on the basis of availability of funds from other communities and raising the burden of the cost of living to our, to our community for the lower income people. There needs to be collective will for these projects. And I think that that's something where we skip past that in some of the projects. I think when you look at the Bean Allard Farm, they raised a lot of money in order to be able to put that forward. And I don't know if we could necessarily say that something like that couldn't go forward without the CPA. And I think we also need to think in terms of other things too. There are other critical needs in the city that could be addressed through a general property tax override that we're using for this instead, if we, cho if we chose to. Can I? We have infrastructure needs. We need to develop our economic base. There are people who want to see more jobs and more opportunities in this community for people. We have the issue of a landfill that's closing. We have a lot of different needs in this community that could also be funded. Okay. Next question, I'll start with, with you two to keep parity. Um, if the CPA is repealed, how will that affect conservation organizations like the Broadbrook Coalition that rely on community support and funds for their activities? <coughs> It's, it's going to be very challenging, there's no doubt about it. It's, um, it, helps, it helps their work. I mean, when it comes down to it, I will probably vote for the CPA. I'm not actually here today to say, you know, let's repeal it. I'm just here today kind of 
as a person who has some questions about it, and who would, and and I've heard quite a few people who know a great deal has been involved in it, muttering underneath their breath about the problems that we have in in our particular law and how it's enacted. Is that an answer? <laughs> it's my answer, I guess, okay? <laughs> but you know what I'm reacting to is the fact that, that this is being posed as a debate, you know, and we're the con and you're the pro. Not true. Well, really. We're here to raise questions, that's all. And I feel like I should explain that we, um, as a league, when we were asked to put together this forum, we did. Uh, we went to a lot of the sponsors of the um, of the pending legislation, of the ballot measure, and they would not participate. So we we asked many many people, and um, and a lot of people that we thought were firmly against the measure um, that, that were in favor of the repeal. Um, then said, well, maybe I'm not against the CPA, I just have concerns. So, so we've, we've, put, you know, we've put together the panel as best we can so that it reflects different perspectives and, um, and like Jesus did volunteer to come forward so that it would, uh, fit, so that their concerns would be heard as well. So, uh, so with that said, would you speak to the concerns about Broad Book Coalition and other similar organizations? Uh, sure. I I was actually on the land committee for the Broad Brother Coalition, but I resigned as an active member. I actually don't pay dues because of my concerns about conflict of interest, that I thought even if I paid that $25 nominal fee, if I was on their membership list, um, that someone could perceive it as such. I, I know that if there is no CPA, that there won't be a 25% state match, and that's way down from 100%, but I think I get less than 1% from my bank right now. So to me, 25% seems pretty good. Um, we also would miss out on two very important programs. One is the land grant program, which will reimburse us for 64% of the acquisition costs of, of open space. Um, that's for habitat. The other is the park grant, which will reimburse us for 64% of the costs of land that's being used for recreation, such as Florence Fields. And the development of that is, is essential um, for the children of the community, and again, if you lose the CPA funds, then you don't have the opportunity even really to apply at that level. And one of the things is, when, when we get those applications, they're always conditioned on the, the grants being successful. So if, the grant, if our grant applications aren't successful to the state for park or for land grants, then the CPA dollars don't come through. So our investment is somewhat protected in those projects. Um, can anyone on the panel name a better reinvestment of money than the CPA? <coughs> Anybody here got any ideas? It's a broad question. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, the CPA is a piece of state enabling legislation that's directed to these four areas. So if our concern is to make the best possible investment in those four areas. No. But, you know, to your point, there's, um, there are many areas of suffering in our communities that can't be allevi alleviated by the CPA. But it's a little bit of apples and oranges because the, uh, the funds are not available for that. I, I'm struck by um, the the evidence, the apparent evidence of a class dichotomy of what communities have chosen to have a CPA and, and those which have not, and what that may imply. I can only say that from, from the perspective of a, of a booster of Northampton, I, I have, we have to start at home. You know, we have to do what's best for us here at home. And uh, uh, that doesn't uh, disoblige us to do other good work, but this is one of them. Um, I think I'd like to say that we have to realize that just beyond the funding, we're also looking at community effort, and we're looking at staff time, and we're looking at the community's focus as well. I think that 
for much of the good that the CPA is doing. And, of course, I, th I think it's pretty clear that without the CPA, the Conservation Commission will have difficulty. I think we need to look at the larger picture. We need to look at trying to invest some of our time in banding with other communities to change those things that are wrong at the state level. We know that there are issues at the state level. We know that we're getting less local aid when it comes to our schools. We know that there are all sorts of strange economic expenditures that are there at the state level. And I think when we look at something like the CPA, or when I look at something like the CPA, I look at it as sort of a consolation prize from the state. Like, here is what your community can have. If you're willing to participate, you can get a little bit back. The CPA is one of those few, I think, pieces of state le legislation at, at the moment that helps us in some ways, but it also hurts communities around us. I, I think that <coughs> we really need to look at solidarity with other communities in Western Mass. We need to be looking at the bigger picture. Uh, a clarifying question. We've been using the term leveraged funds a good amount, and um, an audience member would like to know exactly what is meant by that. What are leveraged funds? Can you talk so, that? Uh, this is actually brought up, or Don and I had a discussion about this because there's a misperception. In, in the business world, when you talk about leverage, you're often talking about your capital plus someone else's capital that is your debt then, that you are you must pay back. Um, so it's a somewhat financially scary thing. As in the banks before the Wall Street crash were leveraged 35 to 1, meaning they had a dollar in and they had $35 that they owed to someone else. So when their investments went bad, they were in a bad way. This is not what we're talking about when we use the term leverage. I think matching is a better way to look at it. If you are listening to NEPR, in the public radio, and they say there's matching money. So if you contribute $35, some wonderful person from Florence will contribute $10 for every dollar. So we will get $350 in addition to your $35. That's actually closer to how it works. So if we, for instance, are told that if we put in $100,000 for the Manhattan Rail Trail, that there will be $5 million of federal matching funds available, we don't owe anybody $5 million at the end of the day. That's additional funding that's provided to Northampton to do the work of the Community Preservation Act. Not, not debt. Not anything that we owe in the future. I think I, think I was the one that used the word leverage. So let me just say, you're absolutely right. <coughs> I'm thinking of it more in the terms of um, uh, providing a stimulus for private fundraising. Uh, and that's what clearly does happen. Um, and uh, access to additional funds so that the CPA is not the only that's not the only money at the table. In some cases, it's just the tip of the, the iceberg. It's the seed money. It's the encouragement. And I think that's an important part of what CPA does, is provide that encouragement. The yes, we, yes, we can do this uh, uh, message. I assume you all don't have anything to add to that? I could. That was just a clarifying <laughs> question. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's not, I understand, it's not bad leverage. What they, right, the right. moguls on uh, Wall Street do. Yes. It's, it's put the good leverage in. And we have a little it's effort the lifting. here. It's the lifting. You lift and you lift resources elsewhere. Money out of other people's pockets. <laughs> <laughs> my, 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 all the money I sent in Boston it comes back to me at long last. Yeah, I know. Pardon? But, you know, there is, a, there is a point in this whole thing that um, that I see that we have an enormous amount of greed in this community for Boston money. In fact, one, uh, one, uh, one uh, guy who was on the city council told me that the other day, that this was the guiding principle of why we got where we are today, wherever that is, was that we go after and we get every dime we can from Boston. Well, that dime you're getting from Boston is out of somebody else's pocket, like he's saying. Somebody who lives in Holyoke, somebody who lives in Springfield, somebody else. So let's 
modify. No, kind of cool. Can I speak to the leveraging thing a little bit? <laughs> or, uh, if you want to move to the next question, that's fine. But I do have um, a comment. I, I would like to move to the next question, okay. which might allow you to okay. work it in. Um, uh, this audience member's concern is that we continue to have partition, um, we continue to partition our taxes. We have a base property tax, then an override for the high school, an override for the fire station, an override for the police station, next to the DPW. Where does it end? When we have a serious need for money, will the pot be empty? <sighs> so, I would definitely like to speak to that. Right. So, why don't you start? <coughs> And I, I think this is really where some of the concerns that I'm bringing up really make a lot more sense. Um, when we participate in things like the CPA in order to improve some of the uh, amenities and attractions to our community to make it more viable, we're, we're engaging in that race to the bottom. Um, it's very clear that the benefit of state money is not shared equally. I think we really need to be focusing on things like an act to invest in our communities. We need to see change and reform at the state level in the way that our money is being managed. When we're talking about leveraging funds from other grant sources, a lot of those grant sources are state and federal money as well. Again, that's our money again. Um, it's, I see it as sort of a shell game. Um, I think we need to be looking for transparency at the state level in terms of, in, in terms of distribution of money to the communities, and we need to be looking at really joining with other communities and focusing on those very critical issues so that we can all benefit and so we're not having losers and winners. It doesn't need to be that way. Um, I'd like to say something. Um, I'm no, sorry. Okay, we, we said one response for each side, if that's all right. What? So, we said one response from okay. each side, so. Um, just a, um, if I could, um, we have basically we have meals tax, we have sales tax, we have a flat rate income tax, and we have real estate taxes. I think that's really where the state money comes from. And to greater or lesser degrees, they're all regressive. Um, of these, the real estate tax um, uh, is perhaps slightly re less regressive than the others. Um, it's difficult for me to, to advocate any of these, and there clearly is a point at which there's um, the community can't bear anymore. And I don't, you know, that different pe people's pots will go dry at different times. As was done with the schools over time, um, as as these 20-year bonds wear out and are retired, new projects can be undertaken. And so uh, one hopes that over time there are not great peaks in in the in the surcharges. Um, they, the, the overrides are a function of a state-mandated two-and-a-half property tax over which the local citizens have very little control and our elected officials have no control. <coughs> so it's a peculiar outcome of a, another piece of state legislation that we find ourselves having to go to the well one label at a time. Um, my last question is a little more process-oriented. Can can the inefficient use of funds to very worthy causes be monitored to incentivize better use of the money in terms of CPA dollars? Is there anything in place or is there something that can be put in place to make sure that those dollars are well spent, spent efficiently? Can I violate the laws of physics? That's your prerogative. Mm -hmm. It's my prerogative. I have a very ago. limited prerogative. I just want to say something, okay? It has to do with, unfortunately, the CPA issue. It's kind of on the tail of all these other big ticket operations. And, and it's, it, it's, it's, an, it's East Hampton, 
decided to build a, a combined police and fire protection a building. It spent $5.5 million on a combined building that served the community. We probably spent, we've come close to spending $30 million on between the fire and police stations by siting them in separate places and also where we decide to site them. So in a sense, we come down through the years and, and, and the demands are such that unfortunately the four CPA is maybe getting caught up into some resentment of the big, of the big ticket, the nature of the big ticket uh, overrides. Thank you. So, uh, two minutes? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Between beeps. <laughs> so I, I want to I, I use my two minutes. First, very quickly to say on process, um, as Downey explained, um, the process is very open, it's very detailed, there's very there's a number of checks and balances in the system. Um, I, I, don't, uh, I don't agree that the process has not been open. Uh, as someone who served for four years on the committee, uh, meetings that went long into the night, uh, we were dedicated to trying to be fair. I, um, uh, so go to the website, come to the meetings, all the members of the committee, I can say that safely now since I'm no longer on the committee. <laughs> um, but I also want to use the minute or so that I have left to say I don't, um, I don't uh, accept the premise uh, that you make, Jesus, that uh, the Food Preservation Act is a uh, taking from poor urban communities to uh, a community that's wealthier like Northampton. I think it's true that uh, cities have not used it as much as uh, advocates have liked. And there are some reasons for that. Uh, some of them are addressed in legislation that's been proposed to make it more, more workable for cities. Uh, but I also, the folks that I see working on projects, at committees, proposing projects, and again, I have most experience in the affordable housing field, uh, but also an appreciation of the other areas as well, are the people who are committed uh, to making this world a better place, or the people who advocate statewide for fairer taxation for more aid to poor cities and towns, for fair education formulas. So I, I respect your opinion on that, uh, but I, I don't accept the premise that a CPA is, an, is a transfer of money from poor communities to wealthy communities. I think that's not true. Can I speak to this? Um, I'll give you a one-minute response. Um, I'd just like to say, once again, the Community Preservation Act, Who Benefits, Who Pays, is a report that is available online where you can clearly see how this regressive transfer of money works. You can clearly see it when you look at Cambridge and Boston. Boston has paid well over $11 million into the state CPA fund and has gotten nothing back. They have not voted to pass the CPA Act in their community. It's not a community that's going to do that. Cambridge has paid over $1 million into the state CPA fund. They've gotten well over $27 million back. It is clearly regressive. It's something that can clearly be seen. It is not an opinion or an assertion. It is something that you can see and look at the, look at the information. So uh, this concludes this portion of our forum. <coughs> We are going to stand up and take a breath for a few minutes. Next, we're going to be having all four candidates for the Community Preservation Committee. They're going to come and we get to meet them and hear from them and, and ask them questions. So I encourage you all to stick around, but do stand up for five minutes. <laughs> Thank you so much.